John chapter 1 is where we're going to be if you want to turn there. We've been there for a little while now. Um, it's taking a little while to get through the first chapter because the first chapter is just so dense with truth. And it takes a while to unpack it all. So uh, we're going to make it through verse 18 tonight. We're going to be first, uh, John chapter 1 verses 15 through 18. Why don't you read it together with me? I'm reading from the NIV. This is, this is what it says. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, and by him he's talking about the, the word that became flesh. He cries out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. By the way, the John that he's talking about there is John the Baptist. And verse 16, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. So as we look at that, we're going to look at each of those verses individually, and we're going to be talking about the uniqueness of Jesus tonight, because that's a big part of what he's, what he's talking about here. It's a big part of his theme all the way through the Gospel of John. And, and when you talk about being unique, unique uh, means being without equal or without uh, uh, anything else, uh, without anything that's like it, single in kind or excellence or, or, or matchless. And it's a really important word, and particularly in this Im important se section of the Gospel of John, because it occurs twice in the space of five verses. In verse 14, which we talked about the last two weeks, John speaks of having beheld the glory of the one and only who came from the Father. And then here in verse 18, we're told, No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only who is at the Father's side has made him known. And, and there's so many things there that we're going to unpack a little bit of it tonight. Uh, like there in verse 18, when it says, God the one and only who is at the Father's side has made him known. And, and so he, we, he's making it clear that he's talking about someone who was in exist, existence with God the Father uh, before uh, any of this story, before the Word became flesh. So we see then that Jesus, and we talked a little bit about this, uh, I don't think it was last week, maybe in the week before, can't remember, but it was in verse 14 when we were dealing with that phrase. Um, we, we, we see then that Jesus is unique and that there is no one quite like Him and that He can do for men what no one else can do because He is unique. Uh, and so when you talk about John 3, 16, it's the same word that's translated there in the King James. It says the only begotten son. The NIV says God's one and only son. But the whole point of that phrase is that he's a son like no other son. Yes, God has adopted us as his children. That means that I am a son of the father in, in, in a, the adopted sense. But I'm not the son of the father in the same way that Jesus is God the son. And, and so it's pointing out the uniqueness of Jesus, that he's not like other men. He's not like any other part of creation. Jesus is unique in every aspect of his being. He is unique in his person, who he is. He's unique in his birth. You remember we talked a little bit about that, that, that I was not in existence before I was born. You know, when I was conceived in my mother's womb, that's when I had a start. I had a beginning. But Jesus, when he was born, he was already existing. He was unique in his doctrine, in his teachings. You read it in the, in the scripture where the uh, crowds would say things like, he teaches with authority like nobody else. He's, he teaches like nobody else. He was unique in his doctrine, in his teaching. He was unique in his works. Nobody did the things that he did. He was unique in his death in that he was the only man that ever lived that did not deserve death because Sin is what brings death, and yet he died in our place. And he was unique in his resurrection. He's the first fruit of all the, re the, re the resurrections to come. And he's unique in his future triumphs. So in, in these verses, John is, is really keying in on, on the uniqueness of Jesus, and he really points out four ways in which Jesus is unique. Number one, and we're, we're going to talk about each one of these. Jesus is unique in his origins. He is unique as the channel of God's blessing. He is unique as the source of grace and truth. And he is unique because he is the only one in whom you and I may see and know God. So let's look at each one of these carefully. The first one, Jesus is unique in his origin. Now we've 
We already alluded to this. We mentioned it. We talked a little bit about it in the previous weeks. But John the Baptist is actually who is speaking these words in verse 15 when he, when he says, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he is who, uh, excuse me, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now, when you read that, there's, there's different ideas of different people have as far as what that can mean. And it's possible, at least on the theoretical level, that, that he, it can have three meanings. And I think all three of the meanings have some, some measure of truth. But we're going to try to dig down to try to understand the essence of what he's trying to say. But starting with this one, since Jesus was actually six months younger than John the Baptist, which, by the way, I don't know if you you probably know this, but I don't know if you remember that John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins uh, because Mary went to her her aunt who was pregnant with John the Baptist. That makes those two cousins. So they knew each other. There's no question there. But. But Jesus was six months younger or so than John the Baptist. So he could have been saying that he who is my junior in age has been advanced before me. So he could have been saying that. And that would be true, that he is younger in age. He could also be saying, I was at work before Jesus, but all that I was doing was to prepare the way for his coming. I was always only the advance guard of the main force and the herald of the king and and that would, that would be true as well. He was the one who went before him to prepare the way. And so he could have meant either of those things. But I think that it's highly unlikely that those were the focus of what John was talking about here. Uh, because John the Baptist, as we see, is very, very clearly impressed with the uniqueness of Christ's person. And the phrase, therefore, I believe, should, we should read that to, 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 to mean that Jesus was entirely without historical origins, that he was pre-existence. When he says that he was before me, it's not just that he was, the, 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 you know, that somehow he is uh, before me in, in importance or in, or in ministry, which those are true. But I think he's really pointing out, as when you take in the context of the first chapter of John, that he's really pointing out the fact that Jesus was at the Father's side before he was ever born on this earth. He was pre-existent. So John the Baptist is saying Jesus is the eternally existing God. There's a great old preacher. He's been gone many, many years now, but Donald Gray Barnhouse, and he wrote many, many books. And one of the books was called The Cross Through the Open Tomb. And he wrote this, the history of every other human being begins at birth. But the Lord Jesus Christ exists eternal as the second person of the Godhead. Before he was born at Bethlehem, he lived. He was one with the Father in essence and being. Before he came to earth as a baby, he walked among men and revealed himself to them. The Old Testament, which was completed four centuries before his birth, contains many stories of his appearing among men before he came as a babe, child, and man. And that's true. We know that that's true. Uh, we can go back and, and, and we can look and see some of the things that Jesus said. We can go back and read the Old Testament. But we know that Abraham saw Christ in his day. You say, what are you talking about? Well, Jesus said this in John 8:56. 8, Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. And then later, when the, the Pharisees got all up in arms about that, because he said, how can you say he saw your day? He's been dead hundreds of years and you're, you're, not, you're just barely 30 years old. How can you say that? And then John, he, he, Jesus added this a couple of verses later. He said, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. I can't wait to get to that verse. I, I'm resisting the temptation to dive in there because that's a powerful, powerful declaration on Jesus' part, for him, for him claiming to be deity, claiming to be God. And, uh, and so anybody that says Jesus never claimed to be God, they have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. The scripture is very clear. We'll get to that in, uh, sometime down the road, several weeks down the road, I'm quite sure. Uh, so we know that Abraham saw him. And, and what do we mean by that? There, there are these things uh, in the Old Testament and the, the, the technical term just... You ever have those moments when you have a word in your head and just before you get ready to say it, it just flies away? Well, anyway, it just happened. But, but they have these moments 
where uh, Christ appears to Old Testament characters in a pre-incarnate state before he actually comes to earth. So, for example, we know that that uh, that uh, what appears to be God appears to Abraham to tell him about what he's going to do with Sodom and Gomorrah. And what we believe is that that was the, 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 the person of Jesus who appeared before he came to earth, who appeared in the form of a man to commun communicate with Abraham. So uh, we also see uh, from what Jesus said, Isaiah saw Jesus. You say, when are you talking about that? Well, Isaiah chapter 6, one of my favorite chapters is when Isaiah saw the Lord, where he was high and lifted up. And he, and he, and, and he like any human being, when you, have, when you come into the presence of Jesus, and when you come into the presence of God, you, it's overwhelming. And, and Isaiah fell on his face and said, woe is me. And we're not, we're not here to talk about everything about that. But Jesus said, uh, or, or John actually referring to this vision that, that Isaiah had said this in John 12, 41. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. So you can see how the, Old, the New Testament then interprets some of the things that happened in the Old Testament. You see, John uh, the Baptist, John the Baptist was considered the last of the Old Testament prophets. Like Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the others before him, John's role was to prepare the people for the coming Messiah. The only difference between John the Baptist and all the Old Testament prophets was that he had the actual opportunity to point to Jesus physically and say, in effect, there he is. There is, there is the one we've been telling you all about. He's here. That's the, big, the only difference between John the Baptist and the Old Testament prophets. Uh, and, and we need to know that sending Jesus was not a new plan of God. And we see it because all the Old Testament prophets spoke of the coming of the Messiah. You have prophecies beginning even from the Garden of Eden, where when Adam and Eve sinned, what, what did God say? God said to the serpent, he said, he said you, you will bite uh, uh, the, the woman's heel, but, uh, but the, her, the seed of the woman, you, you will bite his heel but he will crush your head. And he's talking already about the coming of someone who would come from human descent, who would, who would crush Satan's head. So it was not a new plan. And John the Baptist just continued in the long line of messengers t t testifying to the promise of God and declaring the gospel. And, and in almost every instance in which uh, writers of the New Testament refer, to the, to the, refer in depth to the uh, to Christ's person, they refer to his preexistence. Like, for example, the author of Hebrews. He begins by writing the very first two verses. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but right there he's just saying, in the past, this is how God spoke to, to mankind. He spoke through prophets. He spoke at, at various times and in many different ways. Verse two, but in these last days, so he's drawing a contrast to how he speaks to humanity now. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. So he's saying now the way God relates and communicates with humanity, it's solely through his son. And he brings out the point that his, that his son was in existence when the universe was created. Paul in the book of Philippians writes, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So there he's again pointing out the fact that he was in existence and he chose to become human. You know, some people in the world consider Jesus only a man. And indeed, he is a man. He's 100% human and 100% God. Uh, some people point to him as, as an example. And he is an example. The Bible says that he's an example. But if that's all you can see in Jesus, then your view of him is missing the point entirely. 
For the first and most important thing to be said about him is that he is without historical beginnings and that, and that is the equivalent of, of him being called God. And everything, if we have to get this, because understanding that he is God in the flesh, that tells us that everything he did and everything he said takes its meaning from that truth. It all flows from that. You see, because when he says something, it means something different if it's God speaking. It, it, all, the, all, all that he did and all that he said flows from the fact that he is God in the flesh. All right, the, the second point made in this verse is that Jesus is the unique channel of all God's material and spiritual blessing. This is what is meant when we're told in verse 16, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. Can anybody say amen to that verse? We all have. And here's the truth. And we're going to get to this in a minute. The truth is, even non-believers can say that. Even those who don't know Christ can say that they, if they, well, they, they won't admit it, but they could say if they were honest and they looked at their life, they would have to say that they have received one blessing after another. You see, on one level, this verse is a statement that all men have been recipients of God's grace. This is what we talked about last week. Remember we talked about, I think it was last week, we talked about common grace. Yeah, it was last week, because last week we talked about grace and truth. We, you remember what common grace is? Anybody remember? Common grace is not the same as saving grace. Common grace is the goodness of God that God shows to all of humanity. That he sends uh, rain on the crops, that he, that he gives, uh, we have food to eat, that he gives us breath to breathe, that our hearts keep beating. Whether you're saved or not, there are blessings that people enjoy in this world because of, of the goodness of God. That's common grace. Everything truly, uh, everything truly good that comes into your life, whether it's health, prosperity, knowledge, friendships, good times, whatever it is, it all comes from God. And that's true whether or not you recognize him as the source of his blessings. <clears throat> See, just because I don't recognize, if I'm not a believer and I don't recognize that he's the source of the good things I have, it doesn't change the fact that it came from him just because I won't recognize it. In, in the book of Hosea, there's a story that illustrates this truth. I, I, Hosea is a very fascinating book. Um, it, it's, it's, if, I mean, listen, there, I love Old Testament stories and some of the prophets, some of the things that God told them to do are just, just kind of blow your mind. But, and Hosea is one of those stories that is really powerful. It's very interesting, very uh, uh, deep. Hosea was a preacher. He was a prophet. And God had told Hosea to marry a woman who was going to prove unfaithful to him. Her name was Gomer which already, you know, he got him off to a bad foot with a name like Gomer. It's like, golly, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but uh, so, but the, why did God tell him to marry a woman who was going to be unfaithful? He warned him beforehand. He said, I'm gonna, I want you to marry her. She's not going to be faithful. She's going to leave you. She's going to sleep around, but marry her anyway. Well, he was, he was told to do that as an illustration of the relationship between God and Israel. Because God had taken Israel to himself as a wife, so to speak. And she had, Israel had proved to be unfaithful spiritually. And God was using this as an illustration to help Israel see, hey, this is what you've done to me. This is our relationship here. And the, the object and the goal of the illustration was really uh, that, that Hosea was to remain faithful to her and to love her even after she left him, even after she was unfaithful, because God was showing that he remains faithful even when people turn away from him, from him to serve other gods. So Hosea's faithfulness, in spite of her unfaithfulness, was a picture for Israel to understand that although you have been unfaithful, that I, your God, will not be unfaithful to you. That's, that's a big part of it. And at, at, what, at this point, uh, well, the time came eventually in the relationship between Jose and his wife where uh, uh, that, that she, she fell into poverty and she ended up living with a man who no longer had enough money to take care of her. 
And at that point in time, God said to Hosea, he said, Hosea, I want you to go down to the marketplace and I want you to buy all the things that she needs because that's what I do with my people. They run away from me, but I still pay the bills. In essence is what he's saying. So we read in Hosea, Hosea 2, 5, their mother has been unfaithful and has conceived them in disgrace. She said, I will go after my lovers who give me my food and my water, my wool and my linen and my olive oil and my drink. So this is Hosea's wife saying, I'm going to go after these, these other men because, man, they give me lots of stuff. Verse 8, she has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain, the new wine and oil, who lavished on her the silver and gold, which they used for Baal. So in other words, he's saying, you're, you're taking all these things, all these blessings that I've given you for granted, but they really came from me. So it is with us. We run from God, but he still pays the bills. He still takes care of us. Now, that is not to say that a person can run, run from God and eventually he'll just say, oh, come on into heaven. That's not what it is. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this common grace that the truth is when we're unfaithful to God, we have earned in that moment death. And if God was completely just without any grace or mercy in that moment, we would die. We would go to hell. We would be separated from him. But because of his grace, because of his mercy, he still cares for us and he still takes care of you. How many of you are thankful, even as a believer, that there have you had times when you were not faithful to God? Anybody here? Let me, let me see your hand. I want to make sure I'm not the only one here. Uh, and yet, even in that, even when I've been unfaithful, he has always been faithful. We, we need to learn that Jesus is unique as the source of all material and spiritual blessings, even when we fail to acknowledge his goodness or thank him for them. But there's a, another sense in which Jesus is the source of all blessing. And that is that Jesus himself is a blessing. And the true Christian, not the non-Christian now, but the true Christian has an opportunity to be enriched by him personally. So the ultimate thing is, I'm thankful for every blessing I have in my life. Aren't you? And, and I can't even begin to name them all. Remember the old song, count your many blessings, name them one by one. And, and, and you, you can't do that. I, I defy anybody in this place to sit down and make a list of every blessing that you have. You can't they're innumerable. We can't, we can't even uh, number all the blessings that we have. But here's the thing that we need to remember. All of those things are superfluous. All of those things, it's like the gravy. Because the real blessing is Jesus himself. When we, get to, when we get to heaven, when we walk in his presence, we're not going to be amazed and say, look at this, we're walking on streets of gold. Woohoo! Look at this gold. Look at that gate made of pearl. That's amazing. We're, all that stuff, we're going to like, who cares about that? Where's Jesus? We get Jesus in the end. That's the real blessing of it all. And, and listen, that we are prone to tire of his presence because of sin in, in us. And, and, the, and we were prone to be lured by the pleasures of the world. And, the, and the, everybody here knows the world does have pleasures. You know, the Bible talks about the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, you know, there is a, something that comes later. But the fact is, there is pleasure for a season. The, the, the trouble is, is simply that those pleasures do not satisfy, satisfy us for very long. And they do not satisfy us completely. How many of you have ever had a Chinese dinner? <laughs> you eat it and it tastes really good and an hour later you're hungry again. But Jesus is not like that. He said, everyone who drinks this water will become thirsty again, but those who drink the water that I give, will give them will never become thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give them will become in them a spring that gushes up to eternal life. And John 6, 35 Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We're talking about a satisfaction that there's nothing in this world that can possibly bring like that. I don't care what pleasure it is. I don't care what blessing you enjoy. 
nothing can bring you that kind of, of, of perfect satisfaction. Just Jesus. When you taste of the Lord Jesus Christ and discover the fullness of satisfaction that he offers, I guarantee you that when you taste him, that the world will prove inc increasingly bland and empty to you. It just doesn't measure up anymore. John also uses the word fullness to describe Jesus and his grace. I, I love that word. We, we, you know, and fullness, I mean, we, can't, we, we kind of read that and we're like, okay, that means full. You know, after having dinner over at family dinner tonight, I have a measure of fullness. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you, you're doing really well, by the way. Everybody's staying awake. So I'm really happy, really pleased after you ate. But that word that's, that's translated fullness indicates Listen to this. I love the, these words, especially the first one. It indicates superabundance. Isn't that a great word? Superabundance, and it, and, it, and it indicates completeness. When, when John spoke of Jesus' fullness, he was affirming that he had never found Jesus lacking in any way whatsoever. John's description conveys a, a, a subtle invitation for us to trust Jesus' ability to meet our needs. A man can go to Jesus with any need. I don't care what it is. Any need. And that man can find that need supplied in Jesus. In Jesus, the man in love with beauty will find the supreme beauty. In Jesus, the man to whom life is a search for knowledge will find the supreme revelation. In Jesus, the man who needs courage will find the pattern and the, and the power to, to be brave in any circumstance. In Jesus, the man who feels that he cannot cope with life will find the master of life and the one who gives power to live. In Jesus, the man who is conscious of his sin will find forgiveness for his sin and the strength to live a godly life. In Jesus, the fullness of God, all that is in God, becomes available to men. Whatever you need, you will find in Jesus. And that supply will never run out. Now look at verses 17 and 18. In verses 17 and 18, the Apostle John records two other things about the uniqueness of Jesus. First, he says that Jesus is unique as the source of grace and truth. Now, we talked last week, we talked the whole Time, the whole lesson on grace and truth. But look at verse 17. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So he's setting up some sort of contrast here because otherwise bring up the law that was given through Moses and then compare that with the grace and truth that came through Jesus Christ. Well, so that verse clearly suggests a contrast that gives the words grace and truth a slightly different meaning than they had in the, pre three, in the three verses earlier. I want to say this, contrary to many people's understanding, the giving of the law was a matter of grace. Now, I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Uh, God has always, even, even in, the, in the Old Testament, even when the law was given, God has always desired his people to respond to him in faith. And as a result of that faith, to live in obedience to his word. Abraham was, had righteousness uh, accounted to him because of his faith. That was before the law ever came. So we can see all throughout the Old Testament, God was calling people to have faith in him, and that was how they were, how they were saved. That's how they found righteousness. He's always desired that. However, because of the Israelites' lack of faith and because of their disobedience, God gave them the law as a means of protection. The law was able to show them the sinfulness of their actions. That, and that's really what the law was for, was to show us that we are sinful. And also, by the way, to show us that there's no way we can save ourselves. Uh, but, but the law, even though it shows their sinfulness, it was never intended to save the Jews. That wasn't the goal of it. That wasn't the point of it. Uh, now, technically... A person could be saved by the law if from the moment they took their first breath till they took their dying breath, they never broke a single law of God. Good luck with that. 
It's not going to happen. Uh, you know, and so the, the purpose of the law was not to draw people to itself because the law has no grace to offer. The law itself is not an instrument of grace. But God w- would give grace through Jesus to those who violated his law. So the law becomes a, 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 a matter of grace in the sense that it points us to our need for grace. So the law is not grace, obviously, but the law was a tool that God used to show us how much we needed the grace of God. The, the grace of the law is what, uh, uh, the grace that you find in law in the law is that it pointed people to Jesus. And you can find grace in the law, by the way. The grace of God was seen in the law everywhere the shadow of Jesus fell, whether it was at the Passover or in the temple sacrifices, all of those things, every animal that was killed in the Old Testament under the law was all pointing to Jesus. And when you see his death on the cross, his shadow falls on that and you say, oh, now I get it. At the Passover, you know, Jesus, he stood there in front of the disciples on the Last Supper, which was a Passover meal. And what did he say? He did not say, this bread is like my body. He said, this bread is my body. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, you have been celebrating this for centuries. Now I'm going to tell you what it means. This bread is me. I'm about to be broken. In the same way that I'm breaking in front of you, I'm about to be broken. This cup is my blood. Now he's not talking about what, you know, Catholics, they believe in transubstantiation, which is the big word that means you know, that when they receive communion, they believe that it becomes, actually becomes the flesh of Jesus and actually becomes the blood. That's not what he's talking about. He's, he's just trying to point to the fact that all of that was a shadow that pointed to the reality of who he was and what he was going to do. When Jesus came, though, the shadows no longer mattered and the light of Jesus Christ revealed completely what the shadows only revealed in part. Under the law... God demands righteousness from people. Isn't that right? Under grace, he gives it to people. Under the law, righteousness is based on Moses and good works and keeping the law, right? Under grace, it's based on Jesus and his work on the cross. Under law, blessings come as a result of obedience, and that's the only way it really comes. Under grace, God bestows his blessings as a free gift. The law was powerless to secure righteousness and life for a sinful race. All it could do is point out the fact that we were hopeless and we needed a miracle. But, but I love what Paul wrote in Romans 8, 3. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature. In other words, the law was powerless to save us because we were weak. The law, the problem is not with the law. The law is perfect. But the problem is is with us because we can't keep the law because of our sinful, weakened, sinful nature. He goes on, he said, for what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. So grace came in its fullness with Christ's death and resurrection to make sinners righteous before God. Finally, Jesus is unique because he is the one and only one, uh, he, excuse me, he is the only one in whom you and I may see God. John put it like this in verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the father's side has made him known. Now, no one in the ancient world would have disagreed with the first part of, of that statement where he said, no one has seen God. As, as William Barclay, a great commentator and preacher of old, he notes in his commentary, in the ancient world, men were fascinated and depressed and frustrated by what they regarded as the infinite distance and utter unknowability of God. He writes, Z- Z- uh, excuse me, Zepho- uh, Xenophanes, if I, if I have no idea if I'm saying that right, but he's been dead for centuries, so I don't think he cares. But he said, guesswork is overall. Plato had said, never man and God can meet. Celsus had laughed at the way the Christians called God Father because he said, God is a way beyond everything. 
At best, Apuleius said, man can, could catch a glimpse of God as a lightning flash lights up, lights up a dark night, one split second of illumination, and then the dark. And even the Jews, even the Jews would have thought this way because for they knew that God had spoken to Moses in the Old Testament saying, he said, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. So there would, so there would be, would have been no disagreement at all from anyone when John declared that no one could see God. But thank God, John didn't stop there. He didn't stop with that statement. It is true that no man can see God and live as God, as God said to Moses. However, it is also true that in Christ, God came to men in a way that enabled men to know him. Having revealed himself in, over the course of human history in dreams and in visions, in supernatural fire in the midst of a bush, in an otherworldly glow above the Ark of the Covenant, in a pillar of fire uh, by day and a, uh, or by night, in a pillar of cloud by, by day, and, and, and not content to send angels to his place, God became a man, a flesh, blood, and bone human being who, who could have been seen, heard, touched, and even smelled. The Son of God became a tangible res- representation of the Father in all of his glory. In Jesus, the Father is revealed in a way and in a depth previously unknown and previously unavailable. The truth is, if we have trouble understanding God the Father, we need only look to God the Son for all we need to know. Jesus said, "This I don't have this verse to put up front, but Jesus said, if you've seen me, what? You've seen the Father. We need to know this, and this is what the world has to know. And this is, this is the part that the world is very confused on. I, I won't even say confused. I, I, I would say this is the part where the world is, has been deceived about. There is no true knowledge of God apart from Jesus. That is how you know God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Now, we we live in a world and we live in a day and time when there are people who will say, oh, there are many paths to God, which is the most ridiculous statement I've ever heard. Because you don't say that about any other thing. You know, if you're going to Disney World, you don't just say, oh, there are many paths to Disney World. Just take whatever feels good to you. Whatever seems to resonate in your spirit, you take that path and you will get to Disney World. People look at you like, you're crazy. You need to get a GPS, buddy. <laughs> right? That's what we would say. Or buy a map. You know, do they still print maps? I guess they still do. <laughs> I don't know. Probably don't make much money printing them anymore. No, we don't, we don't say that about anything else. But then this world seems to think that seems so uh, philosophically elite to say, oh, well, we're above all of this, you know, uh, uh, sectism. You know, the, we're above, above all the different religions. They, they all point to God. No, they don't. No, they don't. Because listen, if you're worshiping a God that's in contradiction to the God of the Bible, it's not the same God. And there is no true knowledge of God apart from Jesus. In, in, in verse 18, there's a word that's translated revealed. And that word is very rare. It's only used six times in all of Scripture. And it carries the idea that the whole story has now been told. I love that. That, that God has been revealed in Jesus. And that means now in Jesus... The whole story has been told. Jesus came to share the whole story of God and the whole story of the perfect plan of redemption. This is not a new story. We've already mentioned that. But in Jesus, this wonderful story of grace is perfectly and fully explained. All that we can possibly know about God, we find in Jesus. He is unique in that. Do you want to believe that God is is a loving God? Well, that's good. I want you to believe that. But I'm here to tell you, whether you're in this room or watching on the live stream, do not base your belief 
that God is loving based on some fantasy of your imagination. Don't say God is loving just because I want him to be. That's, that's ridiculous. That's what could be less reliable than my imagination. Instead, base it on the revelation of God's love in Jesus and Calvary. That's what shows me God is loving. In fact, that's why it, it, that's where I find my worth at the cross. You know, there's been times in my life, and I'm sure you've been in the same boat. There have been times in my life when I felt like I was nothing. I felt like I was a nobody. I felt like I was a failure. I felt like I couldn't do anything right. And in those moments, I always try to remind myself, go back to the cross. Go back to the cross, because if I go to the cross, then I'll see how valuable I am to God the Father, because it was at the cross that Jesus paid the penalty and he bought me at a great price he bought me that's where I find out what love is that's how I know God is a loving God not just because I want it to him to be loving not just because I I think it's a great idea to have a loving God it's because he has shown me who he is at the cross you want to believe that God is powerful, that he's able to bring transformation in your life or in your loved one's life? If so, if that's what you want to believe, don't depend on your own wishful think thinking. Look to Jesus. He will reveal it because the same one who died for your sins also rose again in power. And now he lives to apply that same death conquering power to the lives of those who follow him. He gives us the power to live a godly life. When we don't have it on our own. Are you searching for wisdom? Well, look to the one who has become for us wisdom from God. If you want to see the Father, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. He's the answer. He's the picture. He's, he's how we know who God is and what God is like. And, and listen, if you're here or you're on the live stream, I don't, it doesn't matter. Don't, don't listen to anybody that tries to tell you about God that, don't, that, that doesn't want to talk about Jesus. He's at the center of it all. He is what matters. He will be glorified. In fact, what we read, we didn't read the verse, but it was from the chapter in Philippians that we read earlier where it says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know what that tells me? That one day we will see God and one day, whether we have done it voluntarily or not, one day every knee Every person, even those that say there is no God, even those that say, uh, you know, that Christians are a bunch of fools, even, everybody, even those that, that, that commit heinous murders, it doesn't matter who they are, Hitler himself will one day kneel in front of God and, 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 and say, no, Jesus is Lord, and I confess that he is Lord, but by then it's too late because he hasn't done it, because uh, he hasn't received the promise of the Father He's being forced to do it because, and why? Why is, It's not like he's going to be begrudging and he's going to be like, no, I don't want to say it. You can't make me say it. No, that's not what it's going to be like. It's going to be, you see the glory of God and it's so overwhelming that suddenly you confess and you say, I was wrong. Look at you. You are Lord. It'd be undeniable. It'll be undeniable. If we want to see the Father, look to Jesus. Bow your head. Let's pray together. Father, we want to see you and we and we know what you're like because of Jesus. And so, God, I pray you would help us to not just get into the word, but get your word into us. Jesus, draw us close to you. We want to know you. We want to walk intimately with you because we want to know the father. We want to, that, to have that intimate relationship. And God, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit the one who, who helps us, who guides us, who teaches us, who brings us into that intimate place, who gives us the power to live godly lives in this world. And God, we just thank you. We pray, God, that in Jesus' name, that you would help us to look to you. And Father, we pray for those that we love. We, every person in this room, I know, Lord God, every one of us, we have people whom we love dearly, 
who are far from you, who have listened to the doctrines of demons, who have listened to the lies of the enemy. And God, they are far from you. They're they're living their life apart from you. And God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would reveal to them your glory, that they would see the light of Christ. And God, that, that as they see you, they would see the holiness and the beauty of our God. And Lord, that you would change them. You would save them, God. That's all we're asking for. Lord, let them see the Father in Jesus. And Lord, let them see Jesus in us. Help us to reflect who you are so that others can find you. And we give you praise for all of these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.